that thy spirit function within us today, let our powers of understanding be sharp, and let our comprehension of spiritual things be what God would have them to be. We ask that every friend that sets this afternoon to study thy holy word will come up with something fresh and new and delightful. We ask you today that our lives will be satisfied. There should be spiritual fulfillment in every heart. For your blessings upon these that have traveled so far, and for these that have sought so hard for divine truth, let thy anointing be upon them, we pray in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Before you sit down, do two things. Stretch real big and breathe real deep and shake hands with a neighbor and say, My, you look nice. <laughs> now, uh, the greatest teachings that Jesus ever performed, uh, he taught to one. And his next greatest teachings, he taught to twelve. After that, he was at sea. And so, uh, just how we can get across this afternoon what we really want to get across may be difficult. If we talk to one another or move around, then it will be impossible. The Holy Spirit is very tender, and we're going to move into an element of truth uh, that, that distractions will... Uh, we don't have any. Is our problem, dear brother? I already asked for one. Uh, that will be a problem, brother, if you can talk to somebody about it. If I scream, the only, only half the time, the other half, it'll all be coarse and roars. But uh, we're going to speak to you about uh, the dividing of spirit, soul, and body. Now, we're working out of a syllabus that we use in my school of evangelism. I have a school of evangelism in South Bend that usually meets about once a month, sometimes once in two months. We begin on a Monday and go through Friday because I have a, a little idea inside of me that if anybody knows anything worth knowing, they can tell it in a week. Any woman could tell it in a week. A man could tell it in three days. I don't know that people would understand it quite as well, but anyway, he could tell it. But we believe that if there's truth to be divided and shared, it does not take years to do it. That you just say it and you got it. In fact, if you this afternoon would stick to me with me for four of these sessions, I believe that you would understand and know as much about the dividing of spirit and soul as I did in 20 years. There are some truths that come very expensive. What I'm going to share with you in these four labs, I sought after for, for 20 years solidly. Almost every person I would meet that had an unusual understanding of the Word of God, I would say, what is the human heart? That thing in there is about the size of your fist that pumps day and night. What is that thing anyway? Is it just a piece of machinery? Is it just a piece of gristle? Or is it something that has to do with the immortal part of us? Didn't find one single person had any idea on it at all. I said, what is the brain? That mysterious computer up there that no human being has come to comprehend up until this point. What is that thing anyway? Is it a part of our immortal being? What, what is the human brain? And they found that very difficult to answer. And when they did, they answered it wrong. So there were a number of things that I wanted to know about the inside of a man. And I couldn't find them out. I couldn't discover them. And I asked people that if I were to call their name this afternoon, you know them too. And they couldn't, they couldn't tell me the, the difference between a man's soul and a man's spirit. Now, in our syllabus, which... We have a few copies up at the bookstore, and I'm almost ashamed to tell you about them because there's a total of 25 copies there. And uh, that's the reason I'm ashamed to tell you about it, because uh, there are more than 25 people present. How many believe that? That's believe in your eyes. That's your body. In the syllabus here, I have 13 lessons. One is called The Mystery of the Human Personality. The second is Unity and Identity. The third, the chemistry of the spirit. The fourth, the chemistry of the soul. The fifth, the human mind and spiritual health. The sixth, the death of the human spirit, how it died. The seventh, the dividing of soul and spirit. Eight, Christ's spirit, soul and body. That would be one of the most important of the chapters. We want to be like Christ. 
Paul says we have the mind of Christ. We also want to have the spirit of Christ. And it would be good to have the body of Christ. Christ's body was a healthy body. It was a good body. It went around loving people and helping people. Christ's body never cursed anybody, never hurt anybody. Would you want a body like the body of Jesus? Well, come on, don't just look at me. Thank you very much. That's number eight. Number nine, how Christians live by the Spirit. By their spirit, not by their soul, not by their body, but by their spirit. Number ten, the communication of the spirit of man. How the spirit of man does its communicating. Because your, your central communications should be from your spirit area. And not from your soulish or solical or from your body area. And then the eleventh one is the regenerated spirit. Uh, what happened when the prodigal son returned home? The father openly and loudly said, This my son which was dead is alive. Now, it was Jesus that said those words, and Jesus never lied. I mean, agree to that. Jesus never lied. Well, what was dead? His body wasn't dead. It had been living in the pig pen. His soul wasn't dead because his mind, his emotions, and his willpower were very strong. His mind knew that in his father's house they had lots to eat, and he was eating pig stuff. His emotions knew that he was having a hard time with grunting dirty pigs. And his body knew after eating the filth that he had not had a good diet. So he was very much alive, body and soul. Now, when he came back to his father's house, what came alive? Because the father said, this my son that was dead. It must have been his spirit that came alive. So his spirit was that part of him that communicated with the father. Away from the father's house, there was no communication. At the father's house, there was communication. So a man's spirit is that area of him that is absolutely different and separate from his soul nature and from his body that comes alive in the father's house. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Well, there you go. The, the twelfth of these chapters is called the spirit, soul, and body of God the Father. I've only, I've been the only one that I've ever known that would dare write down what I put in that chapter. And I don't know who's going to agree with me. But I have a feeling that the nose of God is the same size as your nose. And that God smells. And that God's ears and your ears are just about exactly the same size. And that God's eyes and your eyes are just about alike. That when you see God, you're not going to see a monstrosity. Now, we, just because we've been taught some funny things, there's no sign we have to believe them. When Stephen was leaving this world and he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, he didn't see a, a, a Goliath and a David. He saw two that had everything in common. Now, the Bible says that we are made in the image of God. How many believe the Bible? Well, if we're made in the image of God, we're made in His proportions, too. Strange, isn't it? I still believe it, though. The spirit, the soul, and the body of God the Father. And I put them here. God has a soul like you have a soul. God has mind, emotions, and willpower, just like you have. God is a spirit like you are a spirit, you see. And it functions identically with yours. That's the reason when you become born again, the two become wedded. And the two become one. And your spirit and God's spirit walks together. And, and that's what it means by being born again. Then the last of the lessons is chapter 13. It's the spirit in controversy with the soul. And, and that is a thing that never ends until you get to heaven. Uh, the soul, uh, the soulish nature, the Adamic nature, is in, is in uh, battle with the spirit nature. And you have to determine who's going to win. Let's read a couple of scriptures here. I don't know how far we can get in one day, but I'll, I'll wade you out. And you that are fortunate enough to get one of these syllabuses, I hope you'll, you know, uh, let your neighbor look on with you during the other days so they can, they can see it also. Uh, when you travel by air, you travel a little light. How many know that? That's the reason there are just 25 of them. Now, I'd like you to open your Bibles with me and let us read together from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4 and verse 12. Do they normally have a PA system in this room, brother? Can your friends in the back almost hear me? Anyone back there that finds it difficult to hear me, would you raise your hand? I appreciate that. Hebrews 4 and 12. The Word of God is quick. 
Now, that word quick is an old English word for something that's not dead, meaning it moves. So, the Word of God is living, is moving, and it is powerful, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, If they'd have been writing this today, they'd have put atomic bombs down, but they didn't have anything but swords in those days. That was the sharpest thing they had on hand. And the sharpest of the swords was those that cut both ways. Uh, had a sword had an edge on each side of it, and they and so they set a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing, and this is the important part, the dividing of soul and spirit. Now all you got to say here really is the top line and that line, that the word of God is living, and pierces to the dividing of soul and spirit. I will show you how psychology cannot divide spirit from soul. And I'll show you how humanistic philosophy cannot divide spirit from soul. That only the Word of God and the only people living on the face of this earth that knows that man is a tripartite being are God's people. That in the materialistic world that we live in, man does not know that man is made of three distinct and individual and separate unities. Only the born-again people have come to find that out. Because the born-again people are the only ones with three parts that are functioning. The rest of them are chugging along on two. And we are flying along on on three. If you're glad for that, say amen. amen. Now, it says that the Word of God can divide the soul from the spirit and the joints from the marrow. And that the Word of God is a discerner of thoughts and intents of a person's heart. Now, if you will turn backward there with me to uh, 1 Thessalonians, uh, the last chapter, chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 23. The great apostle, in concluding uh, this beautiful letter that he wrote to the church in Thessalonica, said, The very God of peace. Isn't it nice that that's one of the names of God? The very God of peace, that's his name, that he sanctify you entirely of holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That your whole and entire spirit, soul, and body be blameless under the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to begin with what we call uh, the introduction to these studies, which we could say the two categories of truth. The two categories of truth. And I'll introduce it by saying, I feel that God is doing a new thing in the earth today. He's doing this through an exploding revelation of end-time truth. Truth that is for this hour. No truth ever rejoiced my heart more than what I'm going to talk about in these four labs here for these four days. And I hope that it will burn in your bosom, and that it will become a light to shine as a witness for Christ in your experience. And then I want you to promise me that you'll do one thing. Share it quickly. Truth that's not shared is lost. So if you get truth, share it. If you can't say it perfectly, Say it anyway. And if you don't know it perfectly, well, do the best you can with it. And God will bless it as you do. If you believe it, say amen. Amen. Now, those two categories of truth are these. They're what we call historic truth and pertinent truth. Now, historic truth is full truth. There's no error in it. But, for example, the walls of Jericho fell down miraculously when the children of Israel had marched around them seven days and seven times on the seventh day. Now, this is a proven historical truth. Not only is it recorded in the Bible, but you can witness the ruins near the town of modern Jericho today. How many have seen them? A few of us have. You can witness those ruins today. An archaeological guide will describe for you these ancient gates. You look down the hole. The towers... And the walls. Now, it's all truth. 
But this truth does not cast fear out of a tormented brain. That's the difference right there. This is what we call historic truth. It does not show you how to set prisoners free from dope, from sex, from frustrations, free from the devil's power. It is just plain historic truth. Now, we're glad to know it. But historic truth is not the kind of truth that will save this world right now. On the other hand, pertinent truth is that truth which God has designed for this particular hour of human history. It is truth that delivers from the problems of this day. It is truth that will help you in the toils and the fears of right now. That's pertinent truth. For example, the gifts of the Holy Spirit girds the church with weapons of our warfare. In my little book up here called The Gifts of the Spirit, we call them the weapons of our warfare. This shows you how to defeat the enemy of the church today. So it's a lot more important to know what the gifts of the Spirit are than to know how the walls of Jericho fell down. Now, they're both true. And you can set your life to deal in historic truth, or you can set your life to deal in pertinent truth. If you'd permit me to be humorous for a moment, it reminds me of the difference between a natural history museum and a zoo. Now, a natural history museum has animals in it that were real animals. The only thing about them is they're dead. But if you go out to the zoo, you see the same creatures, but bless God, it's different. You ever see a monkey smile at you? It's something else, isn't it? You ever see him scratch his head when he looked at you? And you want to see what he was, want to mirror real quick to see what he was looking at when he looked at you and scratched his head. Well, there's a difference in truth. Just like there's difference in a natural history museum and a zoo. You and I want to deal, we're living in an age of emergency. We're living in an age when the world could come to an end. We need the kind of truth that will help us in this hour. My ministry, in the greatest part, is directed toward this pertinent truth. In a very limited capacity do I ever minister in what I call traditional and historic truth. Not very much. My calling that God has placed upon my life is to untie the knots of today's problems and to preach that there is a cosmos in today's chaotic world And that we today can know the mind of God, the heart of God, the ways of God. That we can have the spiritual vibrations surging through our being that God wants us to have today. We can know that we know that we know. Glory be to God. We're not wandering in a morass of uncertainties, but bless God we know. I'm sure you've heard about the Arab. When his son was leaving home, he said, son... If you find a man who knows not, and he knows not that he knows not, he's stupid. Don't follow him. And he says, son, if you find a man and he knows not, and he knows that he knows not, he's simple. Just teach him. And he says, son, if you find a man that knows, and he knows not that he knows, he's asleep. Wake him up. But said, if you find a man who knows, and he knows that he knows, then follow him. He's wise. And that's what God wants us all to do. Can you say amen? amen? And for God's sakes, don't be following a fellow that don't know anything and don't know that he knows anything. That's a mess. There are two kinds of truth. That's what we've said thus far. Now, what is the spirit of a man? What is the human spirit? What constitutes the mind? What is the mind of a human being? What is the human heart? I'd like to say first about it this. I find it impossible to accept humanistic philosophy and psychology that man is dualistic. That man is only breath and matter. I don't believe that. I cannot accept the evaluation of the concepts of modern teachings today that man is made up of mind and mud. And that's all there is to it. I do not believe that death is the final terminus to the human personality. I believe our personality that we have today is going to live and live and live and live forever and ever. If you believe it, say amen. Therefore, we reject the teachings of modern psychologists and philosophers who teach that man is only a dualism made up of an inside and outside, top side and bottom side. 
that he's only made of two parts, the visible and the invisible. We believe that man is more than just mind and matter. I believe that a paramount truth that this generation must face is a clear understanding between what is spirit and what is soul in the human personality. It is of great significance that we understand the supreme teaching, I believe, in order to have spiritual health, in order to know the difference between soul and spirit. Otherwise, you'll never know when you're carnal. I want to shock you just a little bit, if you don't mind. I'd say that 95% of the so-called Christians of America live in their souls and don't live in their spirit, simply because they don't know the difference between soul and spirit. And many, many people that belong to the church have never been born again, and therefore they do not know anything about what we're talking about right now. And I'll say something further about it, if you don't mind. Many people are not ready for the teaching that I'd like to give to you. I don't believe you'd be at a camp like this, among these peculiar people here, if you were not ready for what you're going to hear, not only in this lab, but in all of the others, in all of the other meetings. And I don't know how much you know about the world, but I want to tell you that the group of men that you have here are, are some of the most unusual people on the face of this earth. There will not be another convention on the face of this earth that has the kind of tutors and instructors that they have at this meeting here. There would not be a dozen men living who have an understanding of demon power, that have an understanding of spirit and soul, that have an understanding of living faith, that have an understanding of the separation of spirit and soul. There wouldn't, far as I know, there wouldn't be a, a dozen men living today that could discuss the subjects like you want to hear them. And that means that you today, at this place, have them coming together. And it is the most unusual thing. I hope that in this week you will receive something that you have never received before in your life. And I hope that you will not be critical when one of these men say something, including myself, that you may not just like. Uh, if there might be 2% of it that you can't stand. But the other 98% might be just what you need. So don't, don't close your spirit up because one of us might say something that just doesn't quite please you. Because I can assure you, you are, a, you are at a most unusual place to receive something from God. In a meeting a few moments ago, some 40 or 50 received the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Don't you think that's a wonderful thing? Yes. And so, we, we are in a place here where things can happen. We don't know. God might generate something here on these campgrounds that will be carried to the four corners of the earth. We know that we are living in amazing times and wonderful times. And we want to be ready to be and to do what God would have us to be and to do. Can you say amen? amen. This new life that we're talking about has to do with the second Adam, not with the first Adam. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 22, it says, As in Adam we all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So the very beginning of the truth that we wish to present is this, that we come alive in the second Adam. Something comes alive in the second Adam that does not come alive any other way, excepting through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring new life and new spirit into a man and into a woman. You are in three parts. You are made up of a spirit and a soul and a body. When God made Adam, God made him spirit, soul, and body. God made his spirit to be king. The spirit is the king of his life. God made his soul to be a servant. Now, that's just what's wrong with the world today. And 99% of the total population on the face of this earth, soul is now king. Because soul is three things. Soul is mind, emotions, and willpower. But when servant becomes king, what do you have in the world? You have chaos. You have sorrows. You have problems. You have things out of joint. You have things that you don't know what to do about. Because a servant has now become king. 
I've heard many people say, why is it that a college professor don't understand salvation? It's quite simple. He is dead over here. And through this area called mind here, he's trying to find divinity. You listening to me? God never revealed himself to a man's mind. You never found God with your mind. You find God with your spirit. The Bible says, by wisdom, men knew not God. You don't know God with earthly wisdom. Here's an amazing thing. Your children can live in your house and go to your church five times a week and get grown and know nothing about the whole thing. Because I'm one of them, I know. I became a grown man and I didn't know anything about it yet. Lived around it all my life. And suddenly, my heart opened to God. My being opened to God. I became born again. And suddenly, I understood what it was all about. But I didn't understand as long as I was thinking it out with my mind and trying to reason it out with my mind, trying to feel it out with my emotions and determine it out with my will. Man is composed of three areas of life. He has life in his spirit. He has life in his soul. And he has life in his body. Never said that before. Let me write it down. If you don't believe I'm learning, you just hadn't been around. Man has life in three departments of his total being. Life. He has life in his spirit, that is real life. He has life in his soul, which is real life. He has life in his body, which is real life. Now, in our, in our syllabus, in the back of it, I draw you uh, an entire story of spirit and tell you what it is down to here, and soul telling you what it is down here, and body showing you the five senses of the body, showing you the realms in which a person can live. Now, what God wants is for every one of us to live with our spirits. He wants spirit to be king. Now, you might have wondered when David was saying, Why thou cast down, O my soul? Rejoice thou in the Lord. It sounded like he was crazy. Because it was David talking. David was talking to David. You say, what was happening to him? It was his spirit talking to his soul, demanding, demanding that it worship and praise the Lord. So his spirit was saying to his mind, time to praise the Lord over their mind, get at it. His spirit was saying to his emotions, stop your grumbling and start praising the Lord. See? Now, you know why you grumble? It's because servant is king in your life. And there's no extra charge. When your emotions become a king, and you ride the wave of your emotions. I feel good. I feel bad. Then, then you're going to be up and down every day. Every day. Every day. And I'm telling you the truth. Most Christians ride the emotions. As I've told you before, Smith Wigglesworth was one of the greatest men that I've ever met in my life. And I have met the great spiritual giants of this charismatic move of God. Mr. Howard Carter, who gave birth to the whole system of the gifts of the Spirit, as you know them and enjoy them today. How many knows where he found them at? There's two that say they know them. Where do you think he found them? You don't know? You know, don't you? Yeah, he found them in jail. They sent him to jail because he was a conscientious objector in England. And uh, he was adamant, being an Englishman. They said, well, you peel potatoes. And he said, no, I won't. He said, I'll peel potatoes, and I'll eat those potatoes and go out and shoot men with the strength of it. So I won't even peel potatoes. So they didn't only put him in jail, they put him in a dungeon in jail. And it was in that dungeon where the whole beauty of the truth that we know today is the gifts of the Spirit came out of that jail. And today, the whole world rejoices in that truth that Howard Carter found as God delivered him to him in prison. Mr. Smith Wigglesworth I guess you'd call him Reverend Smith Wigglesworth, our brother Smith Wigglesworth or something like that. But I lived in England a long time, and we often call each other Mr., even though we're close friends. Brother Carter and I traveled around the world together, and after years, I'd say, Mr. Carter, how do you feel this morning? He'd say, Mr. Summerall, I feel all right. We Southerners weren't raised that way, were we? I used to go and visit Brother Wigglesworth in Bedford, England, where he lived. He was past 80 years old. And he was so radiant. He was so radiant. One, one thing about him that struck me was that although he was between 80 and 85 during those years that I was visiting him there in 1937, 38, and 39, I got chased out of there when the war started. And uh, even though that 
he was between 80 and 85. When I'd go to his house, he was dressed like what you call a Philadelphia lawyer. I guess the lawyers in Philadelphia are rich. I don't know. But he always looked, you know, so trim. When he'd open that door, you just were almost shocked. There stood a man before you. His hair was white. His face was just rosy. And, and his, his figure was trim. And his coat was just in place. And he just stood there as if he said, what can I do for you? You know? And so uh, I went to see him a number of times. But every time I saw him, he was the same. When it was raining, when it was snowing, when the sun was shining, every time I saw him, he was the same. Just as if, you know, he just stepped out of a box of some kind. And finally one day I said, now wait a minute. How can you, 83 or 4 years old, be the same every time I see you? He sure taught me something. He talked just about like David would have talked. Now he was talking himself. He said, I want you to know, I never asked Biff Wigglesworth how he feels. You stagger back and look at him again. And he's almost dead with Smith Wigglesworth. But it was Smith Wigglesworth talking. You getting me? You see, his spirit had come alive. You say, you don't have anything on the spirit. You want it too quick. You got to wait. He said, I never asked Smith Wigglesworth how he feels. Well, I said, if you get up in the morning and you don't feel good, he said, I told you, I don't ask Wigglesworth how he feels. And I want to say, but if you have a headache, he said, I don't have headaches. You know who don't have headaches? The people who don't have them. <laughs> That's right. You know why you got one? You accepted it. You accepted it. Some of us wake up in the morning, you know, and our head aches, and we say, Oh, I can't get up, and the devil pats you on the shoulder and says, Honey, they'll bring you something to eat if you'll just stay here long enough. And you just stay. Some of you die there. I said, So what do you do in the mornings then? He said, When I wake up, I put my feet on the floor, and I jump up, and I dance all over the room. I dance, and I dance, and I dance. Before the Lord. There's nobody there but him and me. And I said, Lord, this is for you. And I just dance for the Lord. Not for the people to look at. There's nobody there. And you know, the Englishmen wore those long nightgowns. They wouldn't be pretty anyway to dance for people. So just him and his long nighty going around and around the room, you know, dancing before the Lord, speaking in tongues and magnifying God. He says about 15 minutes of that and a good cold shower. I go down. And I read the Word of God, and I begin to pray. He said, I've been feeling good the last 50 years. Ha, ah, brother and sister, we're talking about something. We're talking about the Spirit. Did you know it? We're talking about something. I want you to know that old age and pain don't go together. The devil said that. God never said it. And something else. You don't have to get sick to die. That's what the devil said, too. You could run, jump in the grave, you know. You don't have to drag in. Yeah. Some of us spend about 20 years dying when he could have done it all in a minute or two. <laughs> and the difference is where you live. You see, where you live. If you're going to live in the Spirit of God, it's different from living in a soulish nature. Where the mind and the emotions and the will dominate everything you do. You'd never have a church problem if a church lived in the Spirit. Where you got the mind out of the way, the emotions out of the way, and that pugnacious nature call willpower out of the way, you never would have a church problem. When you have church problems, they're always in the soulish natures of people. But the soul is supposed to be a servant. And so the Spirit speaks to the servant and says, Servant, think this way. And there's never been an atheist that was born again. Isn't that something? You say, why? When the Spirit comes alive, he knows there's a God. That's right. <laughs> yeah. When the Spirit comes alive, he knows there's a God. So his mind starts thinking straight. I want to tell you something fearsome. I had a medical doctor that was testifying in our church recently, and this is what he said publicly. He said that after I was saved and received the Holy Spirit, I changed 80% of all my prescriptions. I says, dear God, what happened to the folks before he got saved? Well, that's the reason the cemeteries are full, you know. You let an ungodly doctor get a hold of you, and the devil might have to help him to kid you. And he'd do it in innocence, don't know any better. After all, he only claims to be a practicing physician. That's all the claims he makes. But imagine, when a man got saved and received the Holy Ghost, he changed 80% of his prescriptions, mind you. 
If you're going to go to a doctor, try, try to find a Holy Ghost one. Bless, bless God. Find a Holy Ghost doctor. Don't go to some atheist for sure. They don't know anything about God. He just might give you something that wouldn't be good for you. And do it in innocence, mind you. Because he's relying on one area and you're trying to live in the other. You see. So the two worlds fight one another. They're not in concord. But when the spirit within us is king. Now you say, Brother Semrall, how do you get this spirit? Well, I'll have to tell you first how we lost it. When Adam lived in the garden before he fell in sin, he was a perfect man. How many believe that? He was a perfect man. His spirit was king. And his spirit and God's spirit were one spirit. And they walked together in the garden. They walked together in the garden. The two spirits are one spirit. At that moment, his mind was a servant. With his mind, he can name all the animals of the earth. We can't even remember their names, but he named them. And his emotions would be under the kingship of the spirit. And his willpower would be like Jesus. Not my will, thy will be done. And that is the spiritual willpower. The spiritual willpower says, not my will, but thy will be done. And then the body is a slave. If you won't get embarrassed about it, I'll tell you what the body is. How many would like to know? The body is a poodle dog. Your body is. You know what a poodle dog will do? Or any dog. You know what a, a poodle dog will do? He can belong to the king or the queen. And he can have raw blood in his, in his poodle veins. And he can be the, most, the best trained poodle you've ever seen. And I can pass by with a piece of raw hamburger meat and say, something other. And you know what he'll do? He'll follow me. He'll leave the king and the queen and follow me if I got a piece of hamburger meat. Now, that's the body for you. The body will follow anything that's on the inside. If you have no spirit and you're being ruled by your mind and your mind goes into a rage, your body will cooperate it and start hitting people. All it's doing is cooperating with the devil that's inside of you. And if on the inside of you, your emotions are full of the devil, your body will go into the same state of emotional rage. And everything about your body will be in a tremendous tempest. Because it reacts to the inside there. And if within you, that bulldog nature says, I'm going to do it or die, your old body will even look like it as it goes along, you know. That's right. So your body is just a poodle dog. Then you let the Spirit become king. And the Spirit says, love everybody. That same body, you know, starts blessing everybody. And the Spirit over there says, go to the right place. And that old body starts toward church. Used to go to the saloon, mind you. Could go there blindfolded. And now it starts to, because the body's a poodle dog. Now the heart is the same. The heart of man. The body, the Bible says so many things about the heart of man. If the Spirit is king... The heart, which is in the emotional area here, then the heart is a good thing. But if if spirit is dead, then the heart is an evil thing. Then out of the heart there proceeds adulteries and, and murders and all kinds of evil. But when the spirit is the king, out of that same source, then there flows goodness and mercy and kindness and all of these wonderful things. Now when God made Adam, his spirit was a king of his life. We're going to tell you what spirit is in a day or two. And his soul was his servant that obeyed his spirit. And his body was a slave that took orders from the servant. The servant gives orders to the slave. But the day that Adam sinned is when the world changed. Now, God said, In the day that you eat thereof you shall die. What died? His body didn't die. It kept moving along for the next 900 years. His soul didn't die. He was still able to think. They must have had a lot of emotional... Emotionalism around the house, one son killed the other. That's pretty emotional. And I'm sure they were a bunch of stubborn people, and so the willpower was functioning. So what died? One thing. Spirit died. And that's the reason you'll love it when I start talking to you and telling you about it. Spirit died. So when he walked out of the garden, he walked out dualistic, actually. He was born a Trinitarian. He walked out dualistic. He was hitting on three, and I was hitting on two. Now, you say, is that true? Yes. That's what Jesus said. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Oh, Nicodemus looked at himself. He was only 94. His mother had been dead for some few years. He said, what was this you said? My mom's dead. How can I crawl back in the womb? I don't know what you're talking about. Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. 
He still didn't understand what he's talking about. He said, you hear the wind blowing? Yeah. Where did he come from? I don't know. He was on the Sanhedrin. He just didn't know a few things. Then Jesus said, you got to be born again. What was he talking about? It wasn't body. It wasn't soul. So it must have been spirit. He was wise enough to sit on the San- Sanhedrin, the highest supreme, the supreme court of the land. He had emotions. He knew how to talk to the master. Notice how he dressed him. Good master. I know you understand and know all things you know. He, he, was, he had willpower. There was something that was dead. Jesus said he must be born again. I didn't believe Jesus told the truth. That means that every human being has to be born in the third area of his life. It is the spirit area. And that he is a walking dead man until he is born again of the Spirit of God. And when you are born again, a new nature and a new life and a new force comes into you that becomes a king. (laughs) Hallelujah. Raise your hands and magnify the Lord. And I shall breathe upon thee, saith the Lord, and thou shalt be new, and I shall breathe upon thee of my spirit, and thou shalt stand up like an army, and I shall breathe upon thee, and thou shalt run and not be weary, I shall breathe upon thee, and thou shalt think the things of the Spirit of God, I shall breathe upon thee, and my love shall flow through thee, saith the Lord thy God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory, glory be to God. Bless His name. Bless His name. Now, I think I've broken all the rules. It's a quarter to five. And I should have let you ask questions from 15 minutes ago. And the most important part of this is you're getting to understand it, you see? And that comes when we have our forum. That's, that's when you really get to know what we're getting at. Now, I've given you a, an introduction uh, I don't feel happy about it because I, you know, <laughs> I'd like to give you about six hours of it, then we'd all, you know. But uh, we, we'll do this if you'll just stick with us and, and, and let your spirit open to it. Now, now, there's no need of us living in the soul. We don't have to live in the soul. You don't have to live in your emotions. We can live in the spirit, not God's spirit, your spirit. And when your spirit and the Holy Spirit become one spirit, then you're God's perfect man. And that's what the Lord wants. Now we have questions. Who has the first one? Yes. Real loud. Our conscience is part of our spirit. Our conscience is. That's the reason in a, in, in a sinner, his conscience just, it, it's, it's almost nine-tenths a dead thing. He knows he shouldn't do it, but he, he's seared his conscience until it's a dead thing. So conscience is part of the spirit. Uh, did everybody hear the question that was asked? I'll go a little slower. Excuse me. I'm getting excited here. The lady said, where is conscience and what is human conscience? Conscience is part of the spirit area. And we're going to get into that. We'll take a whole day on that. Uh, It it is part of the spirit area. Well, then the sinner, he tramples on his conscience. He does not obey his conscience. When his conscience says don't lie, he lies anyway. When his conscience says don't steal, he steals anyway. When his conscience says don't commit adultery, he commits adultery anyway. And so his conscience is a dead entity. It's part of the spirit. That's one of the things that comes alive uh, when you are born again by the Spirit of God. Now, the second question. Loud now, please. Oh, thank you. It's been done. All right. The next question. Yes, brother, real loud. That's very easy to explain. Some people have a veneer of, uh, of civilization, of culture. Now, if you were to go to India or Tibet or some of these areas, you would simply be amazed at how nice a person can appear to be. And you'd say, well, these people are better than Christians. Just cross him and find out. Here's a man here that, oh, he's such a nice man. He's such a peaceable man. He turns around and sees his wife kiss another man. And he becomes a maniac. Well, you see, that veneer was there and he busted right straight through it. You see, and that's the difference between having a veneer and having the real thing. The born, that comes by being born again. Brother, please. Uh, I, 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 I won't be able to hear you if you don't speak loud. Uh, physical death. Uh, physical death is when we step through the curtain into eternity. Our body, our, our body, temporarily lies in the dust. Paul says, 
when I die, my, my, my spirit is with God. To be absent from this body is to be with God. So our spirit and our soul go to be with God. If a wicked man dies in hell, he has all the faculties of soul and body right there with him, even at this time. That's what Jesus said, I mean. And what way do you mean? His soul is alive. His soul is alive. Yeah. When I show you what spirit is, you'll see the difference. The spirit is the born again part of us. Uh, uh, but our soulish nature is our mind, emotions, and our willpower that is not going to die at the grave. It will not die at the grave. It will continue. Does anybody know what time this meeting is supposed to... At five o'clock. Thank you. We've got about seven minutes. Yeah. This lady is saying here that there are people who say, I can do this and my conscience doesn't hurt me. When a little child tells its first lie, it hurts it. Or when it steals its first thing, it hurts it. But after a while, it don't hurt anymore. Because the conscience. They tell me that you can commit adultery and commit adultery and commit adultery. Until finally, it doesn't even bother you anymore. Because you have, you've gotten away from something. You've lost something. And it is possible for our soulish nature to become so dead within us until we have no reflexes as to what is right and wrong. Yes, sister. Loud. Your spirit comes alive. That's what Jesus said. I'll give you one more example of it. Jesus gave the story. It's the story of the prodigal son. Now, the prodigal son was, was in the pig pen. He was gone from home. When he returned back, the father said, This my son that was... Now, either Jesus told a lie or told the truth. So when you're away from God, there's an area of you that is dead. Jesus said, there's something in you that must be born. The, the Jesus also said of the prodigal son, this, my son that was dead, is now alive. Returning into the father's bosom and into the father's house, bade him come alive. Yes, sir. Yeah. I said it was, yes, I, I said it was part of the conscience. Conscience is a part of your spirit area because in the sinner man, he won't obey it. And in the sinner man, you see, he won't, he won't live up to it. The reason that the Word of God tells us in the book of Romans that they that are without the law shall be judged without the law is because I've been to Tibet and I've been into the very densest jungles of Brazil. I've been three months right back into the middle of the jungles of Brazil. I've seen tribes of people that had never seen a camera, never seen a watch, didn't know anything about modern civilization. In those places, you'd say, sir, uh, what would happen if a man tells a lie? And they say, we deal with him right now. What happens if a man steals? We kill him immediately. What happens if a man goes over and commits adultery with another man's wife? We, we kill him immediately, him and her both. Well, then they, they do have something you should call conscience, you see. They do have something like that. But... When that man comes alive, that conscience is altogether something else than what it was before, too. You see? So there is an area where a man has... But he doesn't live by them. He doesn't want to live by them. Those fellows out there, the only thing that keeps them from doing the bad is because they get killed. Capital punishment really stops people, you know. Uh, you, just, you just have capital punishment and people live a lot better when they know they're going to die for it. How many know that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great deterrent to crime when people know they have to die for it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. You see, uh, when we come to the Lord, Jesus says, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So when you come to the Lord, He doesn't destroy your mind. You've got a sharper mind. He doesn't destroy your emotions. He just keeps them on an even keel. So you won't be down in the gully and then up on the mountain and then down in the gully and you're happy one day and you're sad one day and you're happy one day. God no, doesn't want that. Now, let me tell you something. Our churches today are full of depressed people. And it's of the devil. God's people are a happy people. Because in our spirits, our spirit is king of our life. I'll take that just a little further. Even in tragedy and even in sorrow, there is a peace that passeth all understanding. And there is a joy that men do not know except those that know the Lord Jesus Christ. You can go to a funeral of, your, of, one, of your, one of your loved ones. And even at a funeral, you can feel the joy of God down inside of you when you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. So it isn't that the Lord destroys anything. He changes. 
When the Spirit is king, then the Spirit says to mind, you think right. To emotions, you feel right. To the will, you decide right. To the body and its five senses, you see right, hear right, speak right, taste right. You see? So it, it isn't that something is destroyed. In fact, it's made what it should have been before man fell.